Section six of Manners, Customs, and Dress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Donna Stewart. Manners, Customs, and Dress During the Middle Ages and During the Renaissance Period by Paul Lacroix. Section six. We have now reached the reign of Philip Augustus that is to say, the end of the twelfth century. This epoch is remarkable not only for its political history, but also for its effect on civilization. Christianity had then considerably influenced the world. Arts, sciences, and letters, animated by its influence, again began to appear and to add charms to the leisure of private life. The castles were naturally the first to be affected by this poetical and intellectual regeneration, although it has been too much the custom to exaggerate the ignorance of those who inhabited them. We are too apt to consider the warriors of the Middle Ages as totally devoid of knowledge, and as hardly able to sign their names as far as the kings and princes are concerned. This is quite an error, for many of the knights composed poems which exhibit evidence of their high literary culture. It was, in fact, the epoch of troubadours, who might be called professional poets and actors, who went from country to country and from castle to castle, relating stories of good king artists of Brittany and of the knights of the round table, repeating historical poems of the great emperor Charlemagne and his followers. These minstrels were always accompanied by jugglers and instrumentalists, who formed a travelling troupe, having no other mission than to amuse and instruct their feudal hosts after singing a few fragments of epics or after the lively recital of some ancient fable the jugglers would display their art or skill in gymnastic feats or conjuring which were the more appreciated by the spectators in that the latter were more or less able to compete with them these wandering troops acted small comedies taken from incidents of the times sometimes too the instrumentalists formed an orchestra and dancing commenced it may be here remarked that dancing at this epoch consisted of a number of persons forming large circles and turning to the time of the music or the rhythm of the song. At least the dances of the nobles are thus represented in the manuscripts of the Middle Ages. To these amusements were added games of calculation and chance, the fashion for which had much increased, and particularly such games as backgammon, draughts, and chess, to which certain knights devoted all their leisure. From the reign of Philip Augustus, a remarkable change seems to have taken place in the private life of kings, princes, and nobles. Although his domains and revenues had always been on the increase, this monarch never displayed, in ordinary circumstances at least, much magnificence. The accounts of his private expenses for the years 1202 and 1203 have been preserved, which enable us to discover some curious details bearing witness to the extreme simplicity of the court at that period. The household of the king or royal family was still very small. One chancellor, one chaplain, a squire, a butler, a few knights of the temple, and some sergeants at arms were the only officers of the palace. The king and princes of his household only changed apparel three times during the year the children of the king slept in sheets of serge and their nurses were dressed in gowns of dark-coloured woollen stuff called brunette the royal cloak which was of scarlet was jewelled but the king only wore it on great ceremonies at the same time enormous expenses were incurred for implements of war arrows helmets with visors chariots and for the men-at-arms whom the king kept in his pay Louis the Ninth personally kept up almost similar habits. The seer de Joinville tells us in his chronicles that the holy king on his return from his first crusade, in order to repair the damage done to his treasury by the failure of this expedition, would no longer wear costly furs nor robes of scarlet, and contented himself with common stuffs trimmed with hair skin. He, nevertheless, did not diminish the officers of his household, which had already become numerous, and being no doubt convinced that royalty required magnificence, he surrounded himself with as much pomp as the times permitted. Under the two Philips, his successors, 
this magnificence increased and descended to the great vassals who were soon imitated by the knights bannerets there seemed to be a danger of luxury becoming so great and so general in all classes of feudal society that in twelve ninety four an order of the king was issued regulating in the minutest details the expenses of each person according to his rank in the state or the fortune which he could prove but this law had the fate of all such enactments and was either easily evaded or was only partially enforced and that with great difficulty another futile attempt to put it in practice was made in thirteen o six when the splendor of dress of equipages and of table had become still greater and more ruinous and had descended progressively to the bourgeois and merchants it must be stated in praise of philip le bel that notwithstanding the failure of his attempts to arrest the progress of luxury he was not satisfied with making laws against the extravagances of his subjects for we find that he studied a strict economy in his own household which recalled the austere times of philip augustus thus in the curious regulations relating to the domestic arrangements of the palace the queen jeanne de navarre was allowed only two ladies and three maids of honour in her suite and she is said to have had only two four-horse carriages one for herself and the other for these ladies in another place these regulations require that a butler specially appointed should buy all the cloth and furs for the king take charge of the key of the cupboards where these are kept know the quantity given to the tailors to make clothes and check the accounts when the tailors send in their claims for the price of their work after the death of the pious jeanne de navarre to whom perhaps we must attribute the wise measures of her husband philip le bel the expenses of the royal household materially increased especially on the occasions of the marriages of the three sons of the king from thirteen o five to thirteen o seven gold diamonds pearls and precious stones were employed profusely both for the king's garments and for those of the members of the royal family the accounts of thirteen o seven mention considerable sums paid for carpets counterpanes robes worked linen etc a chariot of state ornamented and covered with paintings and gilded like the back of an altar is also mentioned and must have been a great change to the heavy vehicles used for travelling in those days down to the reign of st louis the furniture of castles had preserved a character of primitive simplicity which did not however lack grandeur the stone remained uncovered in most of the halls or else it was whitened with mortar and ornamented with moulded roses and leaves coloured in distemper against the wall and also against the pillars supporting the arches arms and armour of all sorts were hung arranged in suits and interspersed with banners and pennants or emblazoned standards in the great middle hall or dining-room there was a long massive oak table with benches and stools of the same wood at the end of this table there was a large armchair overhung with a canopy of golden or silken stuff which was occupied by the owner of the castle and only relinquished by him in favour of his superior or sovereign often the walls of the hall of state were hung with tapestry representing groves of cattle heroes of ancient history or events in the romance of chivalry the floor was generally paved with hard stone or covered with enamelled tiles it was carefully strewn with scented herbs in summer and straw in winter philip augustus ordered that the hotel dieu of paris should receive the herbs and straw which was daily removed from the floors of his palace it was only very much later that this troublesome system was replaced by mats and carpets the bedrooms were generally at the top of the towers and had little else by way of furniture besides a very large bed with or without curtains a box in which clothes were kept and which also served as a seat and a prie-dieu chair which sometimes contained prayer or other books of devotion these lofty rooms whose thick walls kept out the heat in summer and the cold in winter were only lighted by a small window or loophole closed with a square of oiled paper or of thin horn a great change took place in the abodes of the nobility in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries 
we find for instance in sauval's history and researches of the antiquities of the city of paris that the abodes of the kings of the first dynasty had been transformed into palaces of justice by philip le bel the same author also gives us a vivid description of the chateau du louvre and the hotel st paul which the kings inhabited when their court was in the capital but even without examining into all the royal abodes it will suffice to give an account of the hotel de bohème which after having been the home of the sire de nesle of queen blanche of castile and other great persons was given by charles the sixth in thirteen eighty eight to his brother the famous duke louis of orleans i shall not attempt says sauval to speak of the cellars and wine cellars the bakehouses the fruiteries the salt stores the fur rooms the porter's lodges the stores the guard rooms the wood yard or the glass stores nor of the servants nor of the place where hippocras was made neither shall i describe the tapestry room the linen room nor the laundry nor indeed any of the various conveniences which were then to be found in the yards of that palace as well as in the other abodes of the princes and nobles i shall simply remark that amongst the many suites of rooms which composed it two occupied the first two stories of the main building the first was raised some few steps above the ground floor of the court and was occupied by valentine de milan and her husband louis of orleans generally occupied the second each of these suites of rooms consisted of a great hall a chamber of state a large chamber a wardrobe some closets and a chapel the windows of the halls were thirteen and a half feet high by four and a half wide the state chambers were eight toises that is about fifty feet and a half long the duke and duchess's chambers were six toises by three that is about thirty-six feet by eighteen the others were seven toises and a half square all lighted by long and narrow windows of wire-work with trellis-work of iron the wainscots and the ceilings were made of irish wood the same as at the louvre in this palace there was a room used by the duke hung with cloth of gold bordered with vermilion velvet embroidered with roses the duchess had a room hung with vermilion satin embroidered with crossbows which were on her coat of arms that of the duke of burgundy was hung with cloth of gold embroidered with windmills there were besides eight carpets of glossy texture with gold flowers one representing the seven virtues and the seven vices another the history of charlemagne another that of st louis there were also cushions of cloth of gold twenty-four pieces of vermilion leather of aragon and four carpets of aragon leather to be placed on the floor of rooms in summer the favourite armchair of the princess is thus described in an inventory a chamber chair with four supports painted in fine vermilion the seat and arms of which are covered with vermilion morocco or cordovan worked and stamped with designs representing the sun birds and other devices bordered with fringes of silk and studded with nails among the ornamental furniture were a large vase of massive silver for holding sugar-plums or sweetmeats shaped like a square table supported by four satyrs also of silver a fine wooden casket covered with vermilion cordovan nailed and bordered with a narrow gilt band shutting with a key in the daily life of louis of orleans and his wife everything corresponded with the luxury of their house thus for the amusement of their children two little books of pictures were made illuminated with gold azure and vermilion and covered with vermilion leather of cordova which cost sixty sol parisi i e four hundred francs but it was in the custom of new year's gifts that the duke and duchess displayed the true royal magnificence as we find described in the accounts of their expenses for instance in thirteen eighty eight they paid four hundred francs of gold for sheets of silk to give to those who received the new year's gifts from the king and queen 
in fourteen o two one hundred pounds tournois was given to jehan taillen goldsmith for six silver cups presented to jacques de pochin the duke's squire to the sire de la tremouille valentine gives a cup and basin of gold to queen isabella a golden image of st john surrounded with nine rubies one sapphire and twenty-one pearls to mademoiselle de luxembourg another small golden sacred image surrounded with pearls and lastly in an account of thirteen ninety four headed portion of gold and silver jewels bought by madame la duchesse d'orleans as a new year's gift we find a clasp of gold studded with one large ruby and six large pearls given to the king three paternosters for the king's daughters and two large diamonds for the dukes of burgundy and berry such were the habits in private life of the royal princes under charles the sixth and it can easily be shown that the example of royalty was followed not only by the court but also in the remotest provinces the great tenants or vassals of the crown each possessed several splendid mansions in their fiefs the dukes of burgundy at souvigny at moulins and at bourbon l'archambault the counts of champagne at troyes the dukes of burgundy at dijon and all the smaller nobles made a point of imitating their superiors from the fifteenth to the sixteenth centuries the provinces which now compose france were studded with castles which were as remarkable for their interior architecture as for the richness of their furniture and it may be asserted that the luxury which was displayed in the dwellings of the nobility was the evidence if not the result of a great social revolution in the manners and customs of private life at the end of the fourteenth century there lived a much respected noble of anjou named geoffrey de la tour landry who had three daughters in his old age he resolved that considering the dangers which might surround them in consequence of their inexperience and beauty he would compose for their use a code of admonitions which might guide them in the various circumstances of life this book of domestic maxims is most curious and instructive from the details which it contains respecting the manners and customs mode of conduct and fashions of the nobility of the period the author mostly illustrates each of his precepts by examples from the life of contemporary personages the first advice the knight gives his daughters is to begin the day with prayer and in order to give greater weight to his counsel he relates the following anecdote a noble had two daughters the one was pious always saying her prayers with devotion and regularly attending the services of the church she married an honest man and was most happy the other on the contrary was satisfied with hearing low mass and hurrying once or twice through the lord's prayer after which she went off to indulge herself with sweetmeats she complained of headaches and required careful diet she married a most excellent knight but one evening taking advantage of her husband being asleep she shut herself up in one of the rooms of the palace and in company with the people of the household began eating and drinking in the most riotous and excessive manner the knight awoke and surprised not to find his wife by his side got up and armed with a stick betook himself to the scene of festivity he struck one of the domestics with such force that he broke his stick in pieces and one of the fragments flew into the lady's eye and put it out this caused her husband to take a dislike to her and he soon placed his affections elsewhere my pretty daughters the moralizing parent proceeds be courteous and meek for nothing is more beautiful nothing so secures the favor of god and the love of others be then courteous to great and small speak gently with them i have seen a great lady take off her cap and bow to a simple ironmonger one of her followers seemed astonished i prefer she said to have been too courteous toward that man than to have been guilty of the least incivility to a knight la tour landry also advised his daughters to avoid outrageous fashions in dress do not be hasty in copying the dress of foreign women 
i will relate a story on this subject respecting a bourgeoise of guienne and the sire de beaumanoir the lady said to him cousin i come from brittany where i saw my fine cousin your wife who was not so well dressed as the ladies of guienne and many other places the borders of her dress and of her bonnet are not in fashion the sire answered since you find fault with the dress and cap of my wife and as they do not suit you i shall take care in future that they are changed but i shall be careful not to choose them similar to yours understand madam that i wish her to be dressed according to the fashion of the good ladies of france and of this country and not like those of england it was these last who first introduced into brittany the large borders the bodices opened on the hips and the hanging sleeves i remember the time and saw it myself and i have little respect for women who adopt these fashions respecting the high headdresses which cause women to resemble stags who are obliged to lower their heads to enter a wood the knight relates what took place in thirteen ninety two at the fete of st marguerite there was a young and pretty woman there quite differently dressed from the others every one stared at her as if she had been a wild beast one respectable lady approached her and said my friend what do you call it fashion she answered it is called the gibbet dress indeed but that is not a fine name answered the old lady very soon the name of gibbet dress got known all around the room and every one laughed at the foolish creature who was thus bedecked this headdress did in fact owe its name to its summit which resembled a gibbet these extracts from the work of this honest knight suffice to prove that the customs of french society had as early as the end of the fourteenth century taken a decided character which was to remain subject only to modifications introduced at various historical periods amongst the customs which contributed most to the softening and elegance of the feudal class we must cite that of sending into the service of the sovereign for some years all the youths of both sexes under the names of varlets pages squires and maids of honour no noble of whatever wealth or power ever thought of depriving his family of this apprenticeship and its accompanying chivalric education up to the end of the twelfth century the number of domestic officers attached to a castle was very limited we have seen for instance that philip augustus contented himself with a few servants and his queen with two or three maids of honour under louis the ninth this household was much increased and under philip le bel and his sons the royal household had become so considerable as to constitute quite a large assemblage of young men and women under charles the sixth the household of queen isabella of bavaria alone amounted to forty-five persons without counting the almoner the chaplains and clerks of the chapel who must have been very numerous since the sums paid to them amounted to the large amount of four hundred and sixty francs of gold per annum under charles the eighth louis the twelfth and francis the first the service of the young nobility which was called apprenticeship of honour or virtue had taken a much wider range for the first families of the french nobility were most eager to get their children admitted into the royal household either to attend on the king or queen or at any rate on one of the princes of the royal blood anne of brittany particularly gave special attention to her female attendants she was the first says brantome in his work on illustrious women who began to form the great court of ladies which has descended to our days for she had a considerable retinue both of adult ladies and young girls she never refused to receive any one on the contrary she inquired of the gentlemen of the court if they had any daughters ascertained who they were and asked for them it was thus that the admiral de gravel confided to the good queen the education of his daughter anne who at this school of the court of ladies became one of the most distinguished women of her day the same queen as duchess of brittany created a company of one hundred breton gentlemen who accompanied her everywhere they never failed 
says the author of illustrious women when she went to mass or took a walk to await her return on the little terrace of blois which is still called perche aux bretons she gave it this name herself for when she saw them she said these are my bretons on the perch waiting for me we must not forget that this queen who became successively the wife of charles the eighth and of louis the twelfth had taken care to establish a strict discipline amongst the young men and women who composed her court she rightly considered herself the guardian of the honour of the former and of the virtue of the latter therefore as long as she lived her court was renowned for purity and politeness noble and refined gallantry and was never allowed to degenerate into imprudent amusements or licentious and culpable intrigues unfortunately the moral influence of this worthy princess died with her although the court of france continued to gather around it almost every sort of elegance and although it continued during the whole of the sixteenth century the most polished of european courts notwithstanding the great external and civil wars yet it afforded at the same time a sad example of laxity of morals which had a most baneful influence on public habits so much so that vice and corruption descended from class to class and contaminated all orders of society if we wished to make investigations into the private life of the lower orders of those times we should not succeed as we have been able to do with that of the upper classes for we have scarcely any data to throw light upon their sad and obscure history bourgeois and peasants were as we have already shown long included together with the miserable class of serfs a herd of human beings without individuality without significance who from their birth to their death whether isolated or collectively were the property of their masters what must have been the private life of this degraded multitude bowed down under the most tyrannical and humiliating dependence we can scarcely imagine it was in fact but a purely material existence which has left scarcely any trace in history end of section six recording by donna stewart seattle washington